happy Mother's Day. And everyone in this room deserves that. <laughs> because I know every one of you has been in some way a nurturing presence for some being on the planet. <laughs> and that's something that we forget. I know a lot of you already know the history, and in fact, Tuvia published it in his Shofar journey, uh, journal of the uh, holiday, we call Mother's Day. Uh, but for those of you who don't, during the Civil War, someone said, you know, the moms are paying a huge price here. Mm -hmm. Let's honor them. Let's honor them. And she chose the carnation as a symbol of honoring. And um, so that's why you get carnations in most churches on, Sunday, on Mother's Day. And um, what uh, Tuvia added in that I didn't know is the woman who started this process, you know, was frustrated. I knew that. She ended her days in an institution and she was frustrated because it had become so commercialized, but it was the florist association that paid for her institution. <laughs> so it's an interesting little bit of irony. <laughs> so thank you for that tidbit, Tuvia. Ah. Yeah, you know, we all have um, kind of mixed memories around Mother's Day. Many of us did try to provide breakfast <laughs> with varying degrees of success. Um, many of us had uh, fathers who, you know, took a, a hand in that experience. And some of us, like I, did not have that, so it was up to us. Um, and many of us had a woman who had given birth to us who was not really capable of being a mom. Yeah. And mom, mine was that. She provided food, clothing, and shelter as well as she could, which was not usually up to the standards of my schoolmates, but that was okay. And she provided educational and interesting experiences for which I am very, very grateful. But when it came to things like how do you clean house or cook or you know sew, it was her cousin that provided that for me. And I spent my summers with her and learned how to can and freeze and cook and garden and sew and take care of babies and all that good stuff. And when it came to the kinds of things a girl needs to know in order to become a woman, it was her sister-in-law her brother's wife who provided that support for me. And when I had horrible times in my teen years, it was her sister that offered that support. So I was very fortunate in that there were multiple motherings in my life, and that really woke me up. And then, of course, there was my mother's mother, the grandmother who lived in India. And um, the tokens on the table here are in part a memory of her. You get to take these home. <laughs> these are uh, strands that are present in every home in India. And everywhere I went, they were being offered to me. And there are different critters, okay? You can choose your critter or not, take that potluck. But uh, the peacock is to bring more beauty into the home. The camel is to bring more love into the home. The elephant is to bring the wisdom that brings you prosperity and well-being. And then there's Ganesh. Ganesh. Ganesh is an interesting story. It's sort of an interesting mother's story. So I'm going to share it a little bit with you. Um, Shiva is the destroyer. And in some parts of India, he is the only uh, divinity that is honored. Except he was married. He was married to a delightful mortal woman who became immortal in this process. Her name is Parvati. And Parvati and Shiva had the ideal marriage. Anyone who's going for marriage counseling has told stories of Shiva and Parvati. Except one day while Shiva was off doing what Shiva does in the world, Parvati uh, was feeling a little lonely. And so she put together a little bit of clay, and she breathed into the clay, and she created a son for herself. A, a sweet boy, very loving, gentle, kind, playful kid. The best son you could imagine. And she was very happy. And then one day, while she, well, you know, while she was off and away, she, she would bathe on an almost daily basis, possibly several times a day. And, you know, Ganesh, she called him Ganesh, and she, you know, he was playing over off to the side while she was bathing. And Shiva came in, and his wife 
was bathing and there was someone visiting who was watching and he killed the someone, the little boy. He chopped off his head. And Parvati comes rushing out of the water and said, Oh, that's our son. How could you do this, such a thing? What are we going to do? I can't live without him. And Shiva you know, is in great remorse and great distress. And you know, Parvati says, Who will help us? And the elephant comes and says, He can have my head. And so Ganesh is a little boy who really loves his sweets, so he's got a big tummy. And he has the head of an elephant. And as Ganesh you know, is continuing to live with Shiva and Parvati, it turns out that what he does best is sweep away the obstacles as we're moving forward in life. So virtually every house in India has a Ganesh at the front door, very much like a mezuzah in the Hebrew house. And uh, others have Ganeshas in other places. So if you choose that one, it's because you're ready to have some obstacles removed. <laughs> and Parvati continues to be the loving mother of her little boy with the elephant head. <laughs> So, as I look back on the uh, concept of mothering, you know, basically it is that nourishing presence. We call the earth our mother. Native Americans taught us to do that <laughs> more than anyone else. But Mother Earth has been a concept in, in the hidden culture behind the written culture for a very long time. She is our mother because everything that we physically have or are is provided by her. We are born out of the womb of the earth in the same way we have been born out of the womb of the woman. Uh, in that tradition, the masculine is surrounding Mother Earth in the form of life, light, and rain. Now, the word mother is interesting. It's, it's a German, German, Mutter, take on the Latin mater, and mater and mater are at the same root, right? And in Egyptian, the great mother is ma'at, and some of you recall your French, la mer, and the sea, le mer. There's not a whole lot of difference. <laughs> And so, matter and mother and matrix are all the same. In fact, matrix is the feminine of the Latin word for matter and mother. And Demeter is the godmother, the mother of God. Yeah, those of you who remember the myth of Demeter and Persephone, right? The <coughs> Persephone runs away various versions of it. She ends up in Hades for a while and Demeter goes into great grief and so we have winter. And then Persephone comes back and we get spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have we we have this culture that is in so has a weird relationship with motherhood. <laughs> and I think there's a reason for that that has to do with the fact that the alphabet and writing and the linear mind are all associated with the masculine, and the masculine just doesn't know what to do with the mother in the past. It's getting better and better about it, I think. But the mother is something that is terrifying in a way to someone who has never seen or had an explanation for that. I mean, some of you may recall when your mommy got pregnant and there was a baby brother or sister coming along and you didn't know what that was about, right? I, I, I edited a little book once written by a mother-daughter team and it, the story was, well, part of the story was Gracie, this is Gracie's encounters with God, and Gracie keeps hearing everyone talk about her mother um, and there's a, a there's a, something in the oven, and it isn't baked yet. <laughs> and so she starts having nightmares about her mom in an oven and these huge muffins. And yeah, you know, it didn't work. <laughs> and then her mom's in the hospital, and no one explains why. Oh, what's wrong with my mommy? Is she sick? What's wrong? Right. 
and then mommy comes home with a baby brother, and it, they never do put all those pieces together for her. <laughs> and a lot of us went through that, or some variation on that. Yeah. And then there's the whole thing of, you know, how do we know how that got started? <laughs> you know, it was. Yeah, there, are, there have been traditions in some cultures all along that know very well how it got started, but there have been a lot of holes in those traditions in our culture, and there have been times when the idea that the mother gives birth on her own, it's totally without any uh, cont contribution from anyone else, has become the normal understanding, and wow. You know, what's the role of the guy in that world? <laughs> right. And then there's the whole thing of how do we know who the guy, the parent really is, the father really is, which is what the whole keeping her barefoot in the kitchen and pregnant is about. If, I, if, I, if she's, you know, if she's chained down, if she's tied down, if she's locked up, I know who the father is. That's where that comes from. That whole thing of the, the harem or the wife who has to stay home or all of those ways that other, cult, that other aspects of empire culture besides America today uh, have continued to be. And I, there's a wonderful TED talk by a Muslim woman. I've forgotten her name. But the talk is what the Quran says about women. So if you want to follow up on I rec recommend it. And she quotes the three verses in the Quran that say nothing about um, anything like what we've been told Muslim women have to do and be. The closest that there is is at the beginning, the women come to Muhammad and they say, when we have to go out of the town to relieve ourselves at the latrines, because there wasn't any sewage in Medina at the time, they'd have to go out to the latrines in the middle of the night. Men stand by the gate to harass us. If we are wearing the cloak of an upper caste woman, they don't because they know they will be attacked for doing this. But if we don't have that cloak, they attack us. And Muhammad's recommendation is find something, find a garment that you can cover your bodies with, that you will not be harassed and attacked. That's it. That is it. There is no other point in the Quran that says anything else. So she's up there wearing her skin tight jeans and her barefoot sandals and this bright pink top that's got all these ruffles going down the side. But she's wearing a very demure little black thing underneath the top. And her hair is short. And she is saying, if you really read between the lines through the Quran, there are a couple other places where it talks about women, and it becomes quite clear when in Rome do as the Romans do. <laughs> right. But that idea, and then she goes on, she says, you know, you've heard that this thing that Muslim women wear is called hijab. You need to understand that the word means wall or barrier. It does not mean veil. And then it is only later, she says, quote, clerics, supposed clerics, who have written notes on the Quran that have laid some of these other interpretations on what it actually says. Now, why do I bring all this up on Mother's Day? Well, I think it's obvious <laughs> that we are aiming for a culture in which mother is honored but not hidden which the feminine is recognized as an important and necessary part of the culture, not something to hide away and pretend is something that doesn't really exist. Now, one of the things about being in India, I shared last time that there are 80 percent of the nation is Hindu and 10 plus or minus percent is Muslim. So you go down the street, and most of the women are wearing saris in the back streets, in the front streets, in the main streets, it's all Western dress. But in the back streets, you see more of the traditional dress. And about one in a hundred women is wearing the long black. 
a few are wearing the mix in between, the kurta that I wore when I was speaking last time, the red with the scarf. That's actually Muslim women's clothing being introduced into Indian culture. And more and more Hindu women are wearing this clothing because it's much more comfortable and easy to work in. And when my grandmother came back from India, she used to tell stories, and one of the stories that she told was how weird it was to play tennis with a woman who's wearing a sari. <laughs> and they were good at it. <laughs> but if you think about a sari, it's a way to keep a woman from being able to do a lot of things. You know, Chinese foot binding, remember? Most of us, you know, learned about that from Pearl Bach, right, in her books. Um, you know, all of that. The long fingernails, a sign that I don't have to do any work. Someone else does it, but it's also, I can't do for myself. So all of these ways that empire culture in all these parts of the world has attempted to say the man is the only thing that counts and is hidden out of fear what the mother is and can be are things to be aware of and to be aware that today in this part of empire culture we're moving away from that. So one of the things that I have, like to say is before the empire, which started about 6,000 years ago, we generally had women's world, men's world, occasionally on holy days we come together. Women's world and men's world, they're equal, but they're different. They overlap a little bit, usually on holy days. All right? Then the empires begin to form, the invaders come in, and it's men's world and women's world. We only read about the men's world and in fact, there's a book about the goddess in the alphabet, right? And the men's world just you know, ignores what's going on in the women's world. We actually have a continuing women's culture all around the world underneath this thing that's being talked about. And Wicca represents a lot of what the women's culture is about. What I believe is happening, and I'm wearing trousers and many of you are too, is this. We are beginning to be co-equal, hard to tell the difference between the masculine and the feminine because we recognize we all have all of it. We all have the full range of masculine capacity and the full range of feminine capacity. No one is fully one or the other. And someone you know, said, oh yeah, I can see it. There's this continuum of the masculine, and there's this continuum of the feminine, and you, know, you really can't tell <laughs> you know, who's where on that continuum. So I think this Mother's Day is one of the times when that shift is kind of being oomped a little more. <laughs> where this process that we are a part of, people are waking up even more with a day like today, going, what do I really mean when I say someone's been a mother? Someone has mothered me. So I'd like you to take a moment now and ask yourself that question. Who has mothered me? Who and how? What was it that felt like mothering? What was it that I really want to honor and appreciate today? And just feel that gratitude and appreciation that that has happened in your life. And take a breath and take a look at how have I been a mothering presence in this planet? in this time with the people around me. And accept and honor and appreciate yourself for allowing that. Because everyone in this room has been, for someone or some critter, sometime, a mothering presence. And all beings are sentient. All beings deserve mothering. And for some reason, I had this image of someone taking care of a rose bush. That's mothering when you're caring for the garden. Yes. 
And now take a moment, take a breath. Acknowledge yourself for being that and allowing that. And be aware of how we are constantly being nourished, supplied, and supported by this universe that we live in, this Mother Earth, and the sun, and the rain, and all the life, and the power, and the possibility that is surrounding us, infusing us, nurturing us, and supporting us always. <coughs> For so it is. <laughs> All right, we only got a few things. Usually we get a lot more for Mother's Day today. Does someone want to talk about why these